it's so refreshing to see a man like Jordan having this much attention, se s selling out huge venues to just talk about intellectual ideas is, wow, that's fantastic. Uh, because he is someone who has himself, he, he pushes himself, this is what I'm the same, he, he, he's able to handle himself because pretty much any question he gets asked, he's asked that question and he's asked it harder. Yeah. He's found, that, you know, he, he will say, look, if you do not question yourself and push your ideas, you will be weak. If you question them and you get rid of the ones that don't hold up, the ones you've got left, you will be strong. And I, I can't agree with that more. That's exactly my approach. Hey folks, welcome to Sorting Myself Out, the channel where we all collectively and independently work on ourselves and share that beautiful, vital information together, as well as developing our understanding of philosophy and psychology. And this is just a place where we can all come to grow and learn together. The last week or so has been pretty much a grind for me. I had to finish final papers for school and I just got them done late last night. It was definitely a push, but I'm very glad that I pushed through it and got everything done. Today I'm gonna to leave you with a conversation again between Tim Freak and I. For those of you who don't know, Tim Freak is an evolutionary philosopher and a spiritual teacher, and his teachings are a great interdisciplinary blend between modern day science and uh, existential philosophy as well as spiritual teachings about being in the present moment and what is a soul. So I think you'll enjoy this conversation with Tim and I. We start out talking about Jordan Peterson and then we transition into talking about Carl Jung and eventually we end up at the end with him giving life advice to himself if he was 20 years old, which I thought might apply to a lot of us who are uh, just getting started and figuring out what really matters to us in life. Other than that, I just am really grateful for all of you listeners out there. It's just been a tremendous blessing to have your support. And a lot of you have been very helpful to me, especially during the last couple weeks when it was a real struggle for me to get this new uh, filming skill on board in my life. This was one of those filmings that happened last week that I talked about that I had the trouble with. Luckily, we had a backup camera. So you will get to see the, the visual here with that one camera angle. And uh, I don't know if, well, I, know, I know a lot of you just listen on audio, but if you want the visual, you'll see Tim and I talking, sitting on the couch. Came across Jordan as he exploded onto the world scene. And, and it's been amazing to watch. I mean, p partly just extraordinary to see an intellectual superstar. I don't think I've ever witnessed anything quite like that in my life. And it's very encouraging. So my first reactions, which is probably what, a year and a half ago, or so, whenever it was, was, who the hell's this? <laughs> <laughs> and um, seeing my own uh, resistance, my own assumptions, going, mm, where are you coming from? Uh, but then listening more carefully and thinking, oh, this, this guy has, is really thoughtful. Yes. And he's saying something really necessary for our times. So I think, I think Jordan's a really important voice. I mean, I don't agree with everything he says. I, I don't agree with everything I say. You know, I feel like you know, there's a constant need to question. And yeah. one of the things I love about Jordan is he does that. Right. He's willing to you know, not just react, to actually consider, and he's thought about things. Um, but I think he's saying something, a lot of things actually, which are, are really necessary to be said. Yes. What are, what are some of the most potent points that you've heard him talk about? Um, well, I think he, he addresses this in, in the, there's a whole lot of spiritual stuff, but actually the things which relate most that I find more interesting are, the th are where he challenges me. Um, and he's done that, I think, or, or fed into things that I was thinking myself around politics and especially his criticism of identity politics. I think what he's really good at is pointing out the dangers of the postmodern thought and the identity politics that's arising so strongly both on the so-called left and so-called right. And the critique of them, which I really resonate with, is the sense in which they are collective phenomena right. and that they force us into groups so that you get, and in a, in, the, in a sense, this is immoral because you get this identification of blaming a whole group of people uh, rather than actually going, no, no, the, the, it, the moral value applies to an individual 
you can't blame all this particular colour yes. people for something that a few people have done. This is just immoral. And then the other side of that is the way in which um, the, the morality becomes on the outside so that with the politi politically correct thing, which is horrendous, I think, well-meaning. I mean, I was there when it was developing, and it meant well, but it has turned into something horrendous, whereby someone is condemned not for their intention, which may be good, but the particular words they said. So in the UK, for instance, we've just had it quite recently where a politician wanted to defend somebody who was um, a woman and black, po no, another politician on okay. the opposite, opposite party, but used the word coloured okay. and was vilified, even though actually what she'd said was, I support you. Now, for me, that's fundamentally immoral because it's, it's going, it doesn't matter your intention, it doesn't matter what you, where you're coming from. What matters is, did you get the, f the outer form right? Yes. So it's all on the outside. What group do you fit in? What, what formalities have you acknowledged rather than w where's your goodness? Where's your individuality? And then what Jordan does, which is brilliant, is he points to the solution being the individual, that we need to see and develop our individuality. Yes, and it's such a different perspective from the social constructionist point of view, which uh, yeah. thinks everything's a product of society. I, I, there's yeah. nothing essential about nature, there's nothing essential about humans, and it becomes kind of this word game where you're just tossing around these uh, accusations that aren't rooted in any sort of biological premise. Uh, so one of the things I really like about your work on emergentism is that it fundamentally acknowledges nature and evolution and it also builds off of it into the more societal conceptual spiritual realms but it doesn't discount it yeah so so what I'm interested in and I see I see this in Jordan's thought is that we are in an evolutionary process so therefore there is an e there is a biological base and then that's evolved into what will become a social base and that's that's what we individuate from. So we're all born into some group, you know, yes. and usually that's to do with our religion or our ethnicity yeah. or something. But the process of making ourselves conscious is we wake up from identification with that base and we become ourselves. We think for ourselves. The moment we doubt what we've been conditioned into, and, and you know, conditioning's natural. It's good. I'm speaking because I've been conditioned. That I have a language because I learnt it and, and it's just happening. Mm -hmm. That's all good. But I also need to become aware enough that I can question the ideas I've grown up in. And then either I make them my own because I go, no, I like them, or I discard them and move on. And that's the individuation process. And that has to, so the individual individuates from the collective. Yes, and I think that's what Peterson's getting to. Exactly that is separating from the collective, becoming an individual, thinking for yourself. Those are all very much independent. Yeah, freedom of thought. Now, here's what I think he's missing. Great. Um, what I uh, or and, and I may be wrong. I may just not have heard him say this or not heard him articulate it. So, um, this I'm, I'm not. This is not an accusation. It's just it's an observation. So I love Jordan for that, but I think there's a further to go. So what? what the progression I'm interested in is through the individual to what I call a univigil, uh, which I see as the next evolutionary jump. And a univigil is an individual mm -hmm. who has come to a level of consciousness where they can identify with the whole. So what I see with Jordan is he is very suspicious, rightfully, of identity politics because it pulls us back from being individuals into the herd. And he's very, very uh, suspicious and points to the failures of history of communism and Marxism because it's gone, look, we need, to, we need to benefit the collective, which sounds great, but we do it by removing the individual. And that's what's happened, you know, where you've seen like in North Korea now or wherever, where, where the individual is sacrificed for this regression actually into the unconscious collective. And he's really against that. And I'm, I absolutely agree. But there's a third option. And the third option which I'm interested in is that, that we individuate and then we unividuate. And that what's coming through 
and I think Jordan may be actually an example of this himself, but I don't hear him articulating it, is we come through not just, to we don't get stuck in the individual. There's further to go. It, you know, the, the end of all history is not the free-thinking individual and free market capitalism in society where it's, you know, we compete. And there's, f there's another step, which is like an emergent collectivity, emergent socialism, if you like, or emergent um, community, which is not uh, the unconscious collective we've emerged from, but a new conscious collective made of individuals who, through their own volition, are seeking to serve something greater than themselves mm. and coming into a communion with each other as individuals coming into a communion which can take society forward and each individual forward. And the key factor with that, to me, is love. That there is a connectivity between people that emerges as you individuate, which leads you to reach out and individuate. And that, for me, is the hope, that we can go beyond both the unconscious collective becoming the conscious individual, leading to the conscious collective. Yes. Yeah, Jordan doesn't seem to talk about love a lot. And I have listened to hundreds, thousands of hours, <laughs> read his book, Maps of Meaning. Mm -hmm. I've really paid close attention, and his teachings have really changed my life in a significant way. And one of my favorite things that he says is, the best thing you can do is to be meaningfully engaged. Mm -hmm. When you know you're at the right place, and you're at, at the right time, and you're meaningfully engaged with what you're doing. That, to him, is the, the purpose of life, is to be meaningfully engaged. You don't hear him talk about love. And he also says he believes logos is kind of the dominating principle, the most valuable principle. He doesn't really talk about eros that much. Can you speak to uh, that a little more, the eros, and how you think that's the most emergent form of, of evolution? Yeah. So the foundation of my approach to everything is, the, is what I call paralogical thinking, or both-and thinking, which sees you need to see things from opposite, complementary opposite perspectives to really get what it is. So in that way, I think Jordan can become what I would call a monological thinker. He sees very deeply from one side, which is why he tends to be very, very good at articulating a conservative view and attacking the, 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 the dark side of the progressive view. Not, he doesn't, he's not as good at doing the opposite of that. I would like him to do the opposite of that as well, to be articulate the good side of the progressive view and to be see also the dark side of the conservative view, because they're, they're both there. Um, but he, he tends to be more monological, and one of those factors is that he's very much, yeah, logos. So for me, the, uh, logos and eros is just simply love and wisdom. There's what happens, in my experience, is if you wake up, you individuate, you become more conscious, and you start to realize well, ultimately, in the deepest sense, you realize that you are the universe. You identify with all of humanity, all of nature, and then the whole universe. So you're an individuated aspect of the whole. You're not separate from it. And what arises with that is this really deep love. And I don't mean just some kind of hippie, fluffy love. I mean a really strong love that actually is the deepest meaning that you can possibly have. Now, what I love about Jordan is that he doesn't do this kind of wishy-washy spiritual thing of oh, everything's great and you know life's wonderful and you can have everything you want he, you know life's tough <laughs> there's suffering you know it's like you're going to struggle I'm like, yeah that's right good that's a great message and the way out from that is for him is meaning and i yes. agree with that totally absolutely right and that meaning though is is for me is utterly linked to love because that's what gives it the meaning so I want to see love and wisdom together. The love arises from the sense of unity, because love is how oneness feels. So it's a, it's a really embodied, it it's, it's affects how you think, how you feel, how you live, because you're connected. There's this deep connection. But then you need the wisdom to actually be able to do that. Yes, and how, have boundaries. How, how do you live? <laughs> yeah, how do you live? You, you know, do you, do you, does that mean... Right, I, I realize I'm in the whole thing. So what do I do? Give, all my, give everything I, I, I own away to the poor? It says right. that in the Bible. Should I do that? I remember a lovely man, an elderly man who was a vicar saying to me once, I keep thinking about that. He said, but if I give everything away, I'll just be one of the poor. And how will that help? See, that's wisdom. It's like, oh, hang on. 
It's not as simple as that. And what Jordan's very good at is that logos, is that like think it through, look underneath. Where's the small print of your beliefs? Looks good on the surface, but is it? Yes. What does it really mean? And that, that logos, you know, is in really deep. But the, what you're calling eros and logos, what I call love and wisdom, philo, sophia. I'm a philosopher. Sure. Philo, love, sophia, wisdom. They come together, and we need both. And the love arises from the sense of unity. Now, the reason I don't think it's as natural for Jordan to articulate that is he tends towards the individuality. And that's why he tends towards a more conservative uh, political perspective. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think we need both. I think we need to also connect towards this where evolution is going, which is this individuating, which we, is felt as love, connection. And then we need the logos and wisdom to work out how the hell do we do that? How do we create a more loving world? How do we exist in such different states with each other? How do we have boundaries ourselves and look after ourselves and our families and yet also do it in a way that we're taking care of the environment, that we're, we're able to relate to those who are less, mis less fortunate than us? And all, all of those issues. That's fascinating. One of the shadow sides to this public debate that I've experienced is that when we look at an individual contributing to the debate, for example, people are going to watch this and they're going to say, yeah, but mm -hmm. Tim didn't get this part right, or no, that's not true. The thing I think that is the more emergent way of approaching this is that every voice in this public discussion is adding something unique that might contribute to the whole. What do you think about that I idea? I think that's right. Um, and I think, well, I, well, I think it can be right. I think it's very much depends on the, spa the, the spirit it's done in. Yeah. If there's a lot of, um, and I see Jordan getting this all the time, uh, mindless, I guess, you know, attack. And, and you know, I he's not difficult to attack because he's, he's pugnacious. So it's easy for people to fight back. And he's pretty good at handling himself, so it's not a problem. But I don't think those things genuinely help. But if they're thoughtful, if they're like, you know, if someone's watching this and they're going, yeah, but Tim really missed this, probably if I was there with them, I'd go, absolutely right. Yeah, glad you said that. Yeah. Because that's an interesting point too. And how do we integrate that into the thing I was emphasizing? Yes. And that's part of the paralogical approach. Because it goes, I said this, probably you need to say something which sounds like the opposite, but which actually complements it, which, comes, you know, which, which adds to the understanding of it. Yeah. Um, and that both and approach can get you to a deeper place. And then you can start to integrate these different understandings and then we're working together rather than working apart. And, and, and that's the way I see, like politically, that's definitely what I think can take us forward. Wow. Yeah, and it also seems that people have this expectation when they're watching a philosopher or a public intellectual speak that they have to be able to represent every facet of an idea perfectly, which is impossible. Yeah, and, and also, what, again, I love it myself. You know, my, <laughs> one of my favorite answers when people ask me questions is, I don't know. Right. That's because it's a deep answer. I don't know. And I see that with Jordan, too, that he will stop and go, I'll have to think about that. And that's how I feel. I'm, I mean, every day, I'm asking myself and being asked questions where the answer really is, I don't know, I'll have to think about that. And then I will think about that. Yeah, and you're, you have the humility to admit, oh, I didn't quite get that right. I've noticed that already in just our few days together. Totally. I mean, for me, it's an, uh, I mean, I'm moving at fast, you know, I'm almost 60 and I'm moving faster than I've ever moved in any point in my life. And that constantly means uh, being willing to challenge ideas I've had, see them in new ways. Again, you know, one of the things I, I loved, uh, it's so refreshing to see a man like Jordan having this much attention, se s selling out huge venues to just talk about intellectual ideas is, wow, that's fantastic. Uh, because he is someone who has himself, he, he pushes himself, this is what I'm the same, he, he, he's able to handle himself because pretty much any question he gets asked, he's asked that question and he's asked it harder. Yeah. <laughs> he's found, that, you know, he, he will say, look, if you do not question yourself and push your ideas, you will be weak. If you question them and you get rid of the ones that don't hold up, the ones you've got left, you will be strong. Yeah. And, and that's I, I can't agree with that more. That's exactly my approach. And that goes to the point we're talking. That's a very masculine message. I mean, that's on the logo side. That's of on the logo side. Yeah. Toughen yourself up. Yep. 
Get your shit together. Yep. Push yourself hard. Yep. Take responsibility. Yep. Clean up your room. Yeah. Bottom line. <laughs> and I needed to hear that. Yeah, of course. I and needed that, that message. Yep. And I also need, I love Ram Das. Yeah. I don't know if you know about Ram Das, but I know he Ram just Dass. is just this love guy. Transparent. He doesn't he doesn't buy into societal narratives. He's not conservative by any means. And I found a way to hold both of those. They're both some of my favorite teachers. Well, I kind of, uh, 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 in some bizarre way, I, I feel probably, I kind of am both of those. Uh, because yes. I mean, Ram Dass was a big influence on me in my 20s. Um, I ha had the privilege of having dinner with him in Maui a few years back. Oh, um, before I was a philosopher, when I was much, much younger, I was a musician. And I had the pleasure of creating a rave dance track with Ramdas as the voiceover. So I'm very connected with Ramdas. And and I think you're right. That's the, they're great examples of the logos and the eros or the or the love and the wisdom. That that Ra what Ramdas brings is this connection and this love and this presence. Um, but he's also a smart guy. Oh, he's you know, brilliant. He, you know, we're talking about a Harvard professor here. So he's like he he knows what he's doing. Um, but that's the side you see more of. Jordan, other way around. He's much more like you know, and, and he's got that, that male aspect very strongly. Um, and, but I'm, I, I, I bet if you hung out with him, you'd find, you know, he's clearly a very compassionate man. Oh, yeah, he he's, he's comes to tears all the time. Uh, that's the other issue about All the him. time. One of, his great, one of the great things I think that people connect with w about him, and I, I really love, is his vulnerability. So he's both. He's, on the one hand, he's like, be tough and be strong. And really what he's saying, I think, is be strong and tough enough to be vulnerable because it takes a real strength, a real inner confidence to be actually, to go, well, I'm a human being, I'm, I'm scared, I'm lost, aren't we all? Really? And then with that, here's what I'm doing with it. And, and this, I, uh, the, the state of the, the pain in the world brings me to tears and I have to meet it, well, with meaning. And I would say with loving meaning, with, by bringing love to it in a meaningful way. I love that, that's so, that's so well put. Let's move on from Jordan. And uh, what I want to get into next is Carl Jung. Hmm. Because Jordan talks about Carl Jung a lot. I yep. mean, it's one of his main go-tos yep. is Jung, yep. uh, amongst many others. And one of the things Jung said that is right aligned with your theory of emergence that you lay out in your book, Soul Story, is that the collective unconscious is like a two million year old man in which everything that ever has been and is, is available within that collective psyche. When I was at your workshop this weekend, it was just so clear to me that you had embraced that view. Am I right? What, what's missing there? What would you add? No, I, 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 I would say that. I mean, I, with, with me, I've been around people like Carl Jung for so many decades, I, I don't even know where he starts and ends and I start. It's like we're, we're enmeshed, a bit like with Ram Dass, and these figures that have played a role in my life. So. Um, I think that's a, Jung has this idea of the, the, the psyche, the soul. Let's, let's, let's use a more provocative word. He uses the word soul, really. Um, he, he's a soul doctor. And he's going, look, the so everything that's ever happened in the soul is there. And that very much fits into my idea of time, which is that time doesn't pass, it accumulates. That the past hasn't gone anywhere. It's in this moment. And by that I mean this moment is predicated on everything that's ever happened. Without all of that, it can't be this moment. So in a very real sense, the past exists. It's fixed. Now that doesn't mean we can't reinterpret it. And he's, Jung is all about that, is reinterpreting the psychic past. But what's happened has happened. What's come into form has been formed and is, is the way it is. So this moment, every moment, for me is a, it's, it's the coexistence of everything that has been and everything that could be. So it has these two qualities. It's, it's always a new realization. Every moment is different. It's obvious, but interesting. And every moment also contains within it all of the past. Uh, and that, I think, is true everywhere. I think it's true with the physical world. I, I, like I, I, I had a fantastic conversation recently with Rupert Sheldrake, the biologist, and his view of biology is predicated on this view that the past is present. That's how biology works. So it's true in the, in the material world, the biological world, and what Jung's fo focusing on is, is true in the world of the soul. 
that there is a collective soul. You know, the soul or the psyche is much more than a, an ephemeral thing that's just happening now as a byproduct of uh, the meat in my head. There's a whole domain of reality. This is the ancient spiritual idea, and Jung is embedded in that. It's, there's a domain of reality. It's non-material. And we all have access to it. And we're in it right now. This conversation is taking part in it. Our bodies are sitting here in the biological, material, spatial world. But the actual action, and for anyone watching this, the action is taking place in the psyche or soul, not in this world. Where is it? It's in a different dimension altogether. And we're as connected in that dimension as we are in this. And the past of all human experience is there. And what Jung is saying, I think, is because of that, the fundamental building blocks that first arose in the psyche or soul, the first images, like father, mother, day, night, male, female, these are, these are obviously the first ideas that arose. And they are the archetypes. They're the building blocks. And everything has come from those and developed into... Fr so these are structures, just like you can look in the biological world and go, the first forms of biology that were, arose, the cell, is still there. And it's really complicated now, but they're still there. The same way in the psyche. The first concepts and ideas and images that arose, they're still there. They're huge and complex now, but they're all part of that collective, and we are, we are feeding on that all the time. Just, well, again, I love the obvious, Ryan. I, I am, to me, to be expressed this idea in this way, which I never have before, I'm feeding on the development of language for thousands of years, which I'm un unconscious of. But every funny sound I'm making was once said for the first time. And language developed step by step. And now it's blah, 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 so much of it. And that's, that is the collective unconscious in language. One of the, the main distinctions that I've been s wrestling with in your work is that there's the phylogenetic evolution, where we're following this, the life stream, and, and the soma stream, the body stream, as you call it. And then there's the soul evolution the emergence of consciousness, the emergence of energy, spirituality. And I wrestle with that. Robert Lanza wrote a book called Biocentrism. He talks about how he thinks that uh, consciousness comes out of biology rather than this other way around where, where the universe created life. He thinks life creates everything. How do you reconcile those two things? Because the way that you mapped it out over the weekend in your workshop, it seemed as if you, you saw it as Somewhere wet along the way, energy almost detached itself from biology, but still stayed connected. And I don't think I'm wording that right, so help me out. Okay, so um, there's, there's, you've, you've said a lot there. I mean, Lanza has a, a particular slant. I, it looks to me, I haven't studied him in great detail, um, it's got a, a, an idealist thing. Consciousness is the base of reality, and that's come through biology and so forth. Uh, so let, let's leave that on one side, because that's probably a separate conversation. Um, I don't think it works. I, don't think, I think it's a reworking of an old idea that's not quite right. Um, I take a different idea to all of this. So my approach is to say, the, what is the universe? The universe is the realization of potentiality in ever more emergent ways. That's what it is. 13.8 billion years ago, it started with hydrogen, and now it's reached um, uh, to this level of s biology and soul, psyche, this uh, non-material realm. Yeah. So you can see this, this flow through. And in that process, it, there's been two things that have been developing. Every individual thing which has emerged, whether it's an, an atom or a, a molecule or a plant or an animal, every individuated aspect of the universe has a relationship with the whole. So it's a perspective on the whole, even down to a chemical. And it's a unique relationship. So what you see right from the start is subjectivity and objectivity. The subjectivity of the individual part reading its relationship with the whole. So I think that's the simple key to get how evolution's happened. So that what's happened is that objectivity and subjectivity have just evolved together. And it's become more complex, the subjectivity of a complex chemical form is greater than the subjectivity of a simple hydrogen atom. It's increased. And likewise, the objectivity it's reading is different. 
And that's just increased, increased, increased until you've hit biological forms and we've developed sentience. Yes. Now, let me just try this, if I can, uh, um, as quickly as I can. Once you've got, with, with sentience, it's really the reading of a lot of information. Like now I'm reading all of this visual information and audio information. But once you hit biology, you've got a whole new phenomena, an emergent phenomena, which is uh, life and death. Biological things die. And so there's an agenda now, which wasn't there before. And with that agenda, it means that some of this information is much more important than other bits of information. So as we've been talking, there's a, a lovely water feature in this room, and it's making noise. And I'm conscious of it now because I'm t paying attention to it, but most of the time I haven't been conscious of it because it's not important to our conversation. In biology, the most obvious thing as it's evolving is some things can kill you. They, you want to be aware of them. Some things you can eat. You want to be aware of them. The rest, not so much. So what's, what's happened is that certain amounts of information have been lifted up, if you like, and that lifting up or focusing is attention. And attention is what consciousness is. And I think you look at it now. You're, you're conscious of what you pay attention to, and you're unconscious, going back to Jung, of what you aren't paying attention to. Yeah. So that's what it feels like. Consciousness is an emergent property of subjectivity whereby the information becomes so much that's coming in, that the individual's reading, so much, and some of it matters, and a lot of it doesn't. And so the, if the evolutionary process develops this ability to pay attention, and that's consciousness. So the last bit of this, we've got into a very interesting little place here, but the, I think the, the, what that does is, is, is it allows then, for the first time ever, an organism, an animal, to pay attention to the past. Now you've got conscious attention. So for the first time ever, you've got conscious attention on the past. Everything is predicated on the past. Everything is referring to the way it's been. Everything is repeating the past. That's why you know, bodies grow the way they do. That's why things continue the way they continue. That's why the laws of nature work. But that's all happening unconsciously. Now, for the first time, once you've got conscious sensation, you've got conscious memory, past. And there's a big difference you think between sensation and memory because sensation is of something which is independently there but memory like if I look at my hand and then I look at my memory of my hand it's an image yeah. it's of something that was there so now you've got a new emergent property in existence something which has never existed before images have emerged where are they they don't exist in the material realm a new realm of reality has emerged a realm of images. That's the psyche or soul. It starts very simply, but by the time it's reached us, it's populated by, as Jung points out, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years of images. And that's an, a separate realm. So it, and, and, and it's, it's not like it's separated off. It's emerged from it, but it's, it's qualitatively different because it's not made of matter, it's not made of atoms, it's made of images. Yes. And that's the nature of the psyche or soul. And it's that world of immaterial images which spirituality is all about. That's the world that you explore if you're a shaman. That's the world you explore if you're meditating. That's the world that we exist in after the death of the body, according to all the spiritual traditions. Yes. So that is where we go, oh, the, the, the world of images is much more than something happening in the brain. It's actually an emergent level of reality. And somehow it's beyond physicality. It's somehow well, not, it's not somehow, just look right now. Just look in your own experience. There's two things happening all the time. There's a flow of sensation, which is your relationship with things in the world, and then there's a flow of imagination. And the contents of the imagination or the psyche or the soul are not made of matter. They're made of images and yes. ideas and concepts. And they're, they're not made of atoms and they're, they're not physical. They've arisen from this, but they now exist in their own right. Independently. In, independently, completely. That's, that's what I want to clarify. Absolutely, on. they're completely independent, aren't they? You know, it's like, you know, there's my hand, right? There's my, there's my image of my hand, and now I'm turning my hand over with the image, but this one's staying the same. I can do what I like. I can cut that hand off. It doesn't hurt. I can throw it up in the air. There we go. It's like we, we have created, or 
us universe has evolved from lifeless matter to the ecology of life to an ecology of psyche which is all of this world of images which is massive absolutely huge and all of that has arisen as one narrative but each one is different and they're all kind of they all have a certain independence it, it's like my body is made of matter unlike the psyche but it's not the same as matter because I'm in Boulder right now I think the last time I was here maybe it was 10 years ago more every single atom in my body is different so my body regenerated. so my body yeah they've, I eat, that's why I'm eating all the time yeah. they're all new so is it the same body well it's not the same physical body it's a completely different physical body but it is the same body because my body is actually information on a biological level and matter is passing through it yeah I, I was I fell in love with this idea that you have in your book called pastivity mm -hmm. which is what you're saying in part is that we are made up of the the collective accumulation of time and I loved that because I could see the way in which all the struggles I have from the different sub-personalities within me, the, the great realizations, the good days, the bad days, they can all just be s explained from that perspective, both on my independent life and my ancestors. I, I, I blew up in such gratitude at that idea, so I wanted to thank you for that idea. And I'm wondering, what else would you add to what I've just said? Yeah, it's a key idea. So it comes from, okay, so we, we, we talked earlier about the existence of the past, the presence of the past or the pre-existence, the pre-existent being still here. And it affects things. Uh, and Rupert Sheldrake, we mentioned him earlier, I think he was the first person I heard say, look, forget the ideas of the laws of nature. There's no laws because there's no, there's no one decreeing the laws. We need to think of the habits of nature. And what he's pointing to is, is similar to what I'm playing with, it, it, with my pastivity, is that the past has like a weight, as I use the analogy of gravity, that, it's, that it keeps things the same. And alleluia, thank goodness it does, because y if you go to the imagination where it's not like that so much, things move around all over the place. And this is good, you know, my, my hands are still being my hands, the sofa is still the sofa. There's the past continues. And the laws or the habits of nature means that there's regularity and everything's a habit. I'm a habit. Look, I do this with my hand. It's the way my body works. I, I have this tone of voice because I grew up in England and I've learned the habit of shaping vowels in a particular way which is different to you because you grew up in America. And the thoughts, I think, are all a product of the books I've read and the ideas I've explored. And, and, and so the past is always creating the present. But it's not just there's also something creative. That's why the universe is emergent. So it's the meeting of the past and the possible. So pastivity is uh, paralogically, paralogical thinking, so it's good and bad. The good side of pastivity, it keeps things solid for us and we can build on it. So the good habits, hurrah. The bad side of pastivity it holds you back, mm. gets you like, oh, there I go again. The, you know, things There's things the anger. We have to overcome. Yeah. 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 And then, and then you can see, you know, one of the things which technology's done is it sees the pastivity and then it works with it. For instance, you know, I've just flown from England in a great big tin box. <laughs> well, that was because enough creative individuals went, okay, so the pastivity means if you put a big tin box in the sky, it will fall. Is there a way we can work our way around that? Turns out there is. Turns out if you understand aerodynamics and you understand speed and you understand all of that, you can actually make a big tin box fly. But the passivity's still there. You've just worked a way around it. Now you've got a whole new thing. And the same with your own self. It's like, okay, I'm Tim. Here's my past. Here's where I've been wounded. Here's, where I, here's the fragments of me. That's all who I am. Okay, that's what I am. And then how can I heal that? How can I find the wisdom in that wound? How can I bring the fragments together and individuate them into one being instead of different beings that are fighting? Um, how can I work myself around that bit of me that always reacts when someone does that? Can I, is there a work around you know, like the fly? And you find those things and you work with the passivity and you transform it and then it becomes something positive. Now, I have a new passivity so that when that situation arises for me, I, it's, a, it's a good habit. 
Yeah. And that's what I think is, that's the evolving of the soul. That's, wow. what, the, that's what it means. Wow. There's this concept called the shame cycle that I'm very familiar with. You do something you don't like. You feel shame. You feel unworthy of doing better. So you do it again. And then it just goes on and on and on. And I've been familiar with that in, in my life as, as I grew up and now in my adulthood. There's certain things that revisit me. And then the first response is, oh. And then it's, oh, I must not be good enough because I just did that. And so then because I'm not good enough, I just want to validate. So it's a self-fulfilling cycle. And passivity really put that in perspective for me. And it removes the judgment. Mm -hmm. That was the powerful thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, here I am angry, feeling anger. Like, yep, right on time. <laughs> Instead of, oh, God, you screwed it up again. Yes. I think that's really deep. I, I, I'm, you know, one of the things I work with now, you know, the older I get, the more it happens, is I just, is to have that, is to feel like, because of the way the, the past is a habit, when I find some part of me that I want to transform, I transform it, but, you know, be smart, have wisdom. That will come back. Yes. It will come back. So be ready. So don't think you've done it once and for all, but actually know the nature of things. It's like, you know, it's like getting through the winter and going, that's it now. And it's like, no, winter will be back. <laughs> yeah. But next time you know what it's like. So be ready for it so you can handle it. Yes. And then it won't be a problem for you. And that's wisdom. Brilliant. And wisdom is from self the same. And then as you do that more, it becomes less and less significant until it's happening, but it's really not a problem. Yeah, it, it seems to me that human transformation isn't about not being fallible but it's about tightening the realm of my own competency to deal with mistakes. It's having the wisdom to deal with the fallibility. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. Right. Last question, then we'll end. If, if you could give yourself advice at 20 years old, <laughs> because a lot of our listeners are young, I'm, I'm in my mid-20s, of so course some are older, what, what, what advice would you give? <sighs> what a wonderful question. What a wonderful question. God, it feels like, a, a, it's what's interesting about that question, Ryan, is that if, it, what, on the one hand, it just, I'm, I, I've got all of this stuff rushing in, like, oh, there's so much, you know, it's been 40 years, or 20, 30 years. And then another part of me feels, is there anything? Or would I just be encouraging? And I think that probably is the answer. It feels like what I, see from, from, from having lived a life is that I did okay, it, despite all of the embarrassing, crazy mess-ups, which, which there are plenty, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and my lack of wisdom, which was obvious, and my lack of wisdom now, which it becomes obvious as, as still. Um, but I was lucky enough to wake up to this oneness and love very early. So I was sustained by that. I didn't know I wasn't always in it, but I knew it was there. And so that sustained me through my twenties and thirties, because although I would get very lost, I would come back to it, and I fundamentally trusted it, which is why I've been lucky enough to to live a life like I, I have. You know, it's been a wonderful adventure, a wonderful, wonderful adventure, and it's going faster now than ever. Um, and the ideas are clearer, and my heart is still getting bigger, and and I think so. What I would say to myself when I was twenty is, you know, you, you you are you are right to trust it, Tim. And that the fear you have that it, that you don't need to worry about the fact it will turn out okay, if you're trusting the right thing. Don't worry so much about how you get it wrong. Um, keep trusting the deepest thing in you. Keep taking the risk. But don't take stupid risks. <laughs> be wise. Be canny. But fundamentally, life is good. And if you keep wanting to serve the good, serve something bigger than yourself, you will find your way, and it will make sense. And so far, that's turned out to be true. Wow. Beautiful note to end it on. Thank you, Tim. If you have any questions or if you want to come talk to us on Sorting Myself Out, then email sortingmyselfout0 at gmail.com. Dot com. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and 
hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of the content that we're continuing to provide. And we will just continue to be a supportive community of people that care about one another and people who are sharing what they're learning in their lives. So I think that that's a great thing. Thank you.